You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Well, happy anniversary, everyone. Now, you're probably wondering, what anniversary am I talking about? Well, it's the 150th anniversary of Arbor Day here in the United States, and that just happens to be Friday, April 29th of 2022. So today I present to you the story of how Arbor Day came to be and how I celebrated this at the school that I taught in for more than 30 years. I am Steve Silverman, and this is the Useless Information Podcast. Useless Information. Well, the story of Arbor Day is not one that I planned on recording, and that's mainly because I included it in my second book, Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. But on Sunday, my wife Mary Jane came into my office and told me that I should tell the story, and that's because it was the 150th anniversary of Arbor Day, which of course I was totally unaware of. Now, like any loving husband does, I told her no. And the main reason I objected to doing it was that I had just recorded the story of Reginald Fessenden, you know, the inventor of voice radio, and that came from the same exact book. I recorded that about a month ago. I have to tell you, I don't think I've recorded any stories from any of my books since way back in episode 13. So it's a long, long time ago. And now to do two in a month, uh, I really was against doing that. But after thinking about it for a few days, I came to the conclusion that the 150th anniversary would never come again. And it's unlikely I'll still be recording this podcast at the 175th anniversary or even be alive at the 200th. So here it is. I originally wrote this story in the late 1990s for my website, Useless Information, uh, and then I edited it a little bit and I included it in the book. So this story is more than 20 years old. Now, I'm just going to read it as I wrote it back then, but I do have a bunch of little side notes to throw in along the way, and I hope they're not too distracting. But that's mainly because I was able to experience 20 more Arbor Day celebrations at our school. So here we go. When I first started teaching in my current school district, all I kept hearing from everyone was that the kids shut down after Arbor Day. First side note is that I am now retired. In fact, according to my phone, I'm retired one year, nine months, 26 days, 15 hours, 45 minutes, and 35 seconds. But who's counting? Anyway, my first reaction was Arbor what? Well, maybe your reaction is the same. So if you happen to be in the same boat as I once was, I'll explain a little bit about Arbor Day and why it signals the end of our school year. Arbor Day was the brainchild of a guy named J. Sterling Morton. The J stood for Julius, but he was always known as Sterling. And you may never have heard of him, but you have surely heard of the company called Morton Salt that one of his sons owned, which many years later became Morton Fire Call and took most of the blame for the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Born in Adams, New York on April 22, 1832, and raised in Monroe, Michigan, J. Sterling Morton headed west in 1854 to the largely unsettled Nebraska Territory. Within a year of his arrival, he assumed the role of the editor of the Nebraska City News and built a large home on a 160-acre piece of land. His house was considered a mansion in its day, but upon completion it lacked two important details, trees and green plants. Yes, it was 160 acres of basically nothing. It was widely assumed at the time that the land was not well suited for farming or for growing trees, but that didn't stop Morton and his wife. Trees, shrubs, and flowers were planted all around the property, and they grew quickly. So using his mighty pen, Morton spread his word of planting trees to his readers. He encouraged others to do the same. Not only did the trees offer beauty, but they were an excellent way to block the high winds that blew across the plains, provided wood for fuel and construction, and blocked out the intense rays of that mighty yellow thing in the sky. Morton entered the world of politics and was eventually appointed by President Buchanan as the Secretary and Acting Governor of the Nebraska Territory. He later lost a bid to be elected the state's first governor, so he turned his head towards his true passion of promoting agriculture. One of Morton's major goals was the establishment of a day set aside statewide each year for the planting of trees. The new holiday, which was first celebrated on April 10, 1872, was called, drumroll please, Arbor Day. Now, if you're a complete dodo like me, you're probably wondering who Arbor was and why anyone would name a tree-planting holiday after him. 
Joseph P. Arbor was, well, not really. As I soon learned, Arbor was not a person, but a word derived from the Latin term for tree. Duh, I should have known that. Anyway, Arbor Day basically means tree day. It couldn't get any simpler than that. And I'm not exaggerating that I had no clue at the time. I wasn't a language major, I wasn't an English major, and I was young, and I really was clueless. Anyway, moving on. Today we seem to have holidays for just about everything. You know, Secretary's Day, Grandparents' Day, Eat Toxic Lead Paint Day. Hey, there's even serious consideration of making my birthday a national holiday. At least serious consideration by me. So one would think that Arbor Day would have just been another reason for Hallmark to sell cards. But I learned to my amazement that when the first Arbor Day was celebrated, over one million trees were planted in the state of Nebraska. Within 16 years, a total of 350 million trees have been planted. While the state is well populated today, just how many people could there have been living in Nebraska way back then? I was thinking something like four people. In parentheses, I wrote, it was really a little less than 500,000 people. They had to do some serious planning to stick all those trees into the ground. Wow. Of course, the politicians quickly smelled something good to latch onto, and in 1885, Arbor Day was signed into law in Nebraska. The date was changed to April 22nd in honor of J. Sterling Morton's birthday. Yet with all the success, Morton never pushed for Arbor Day beyond his own state. That took the work of a conservationist named Birdsey Norton. He decided to spread the gospel of Arbor Day and encourage that it become part of every child's education. Within 10 years of the first Arbor Day, schools all around the United States were celebrating this day with parades, music, recitations, tree dedications, and of course, tree plantings. Which leads us back to Chatham, New York, in the school where I teach, or I should say I taught, Right after Governor David B. Hill signed Arbor Day into law in 1889, celebrations were held all over New York State. Our community was no exception. That very year, our school planted its very first tree and dedicated it to the one and only Steve Silverman. Oops, (laughs) I mean uh, George Washington. Now, George's tree no longer stands, so one can only assume that it suffered a fate similar to that of that famous cherry tree. Now, there were only so many Washingtons, so in 1900, the decision was made to dedicate future Arbor Day trees to people who had a major impact on education in our community. Today, Chatham has the oldest Arbor Day tree in New York State, and it's an oak tree that was dedicated by the class in 1902 to a Miss Harriet Seymour. Not that anyone recalls who she actually was. As a little side note, that tree really is still there to this day. It sits outside the public library. And it's a Carnegie Library. It's a beautiful library complete with a Tiffany window, and it's attached to the district's middle school. So if you ever just happen to be driving through Chatham, make a stop at the public library and see the oldest Arbor Day tree in New York State. Think of it as kind of going out of your way to see the largest ball of twine. In case you haven't noticed, Arbor Day has basically disappeared from the American holiday landscape. The holiday had been so successful initially that most of the country's depleted forests had been replenished. And with the growing use of cars in the early 20th century, the U.S. government started promoting something called Good Roads Arbor Day, which essentially had the unwritten goal of paving over the American landscape. Now, in jest, I wrote this in parentheses, hidden meaning, chop down 10,000 trees for this new road and plant one new one over there. This and many other factors led to the demise of Arbor Day. Even in Chatham, where Arbor Day is still celebrated each year, the day has been watered down to basically nothing. And I'm kind of exaggerating there. You see, different district administrators have tried unsuccessfully to get the day wiped off the calendar. And that's mostly because it's a pain in the neck to deal with. What was once an entire week of activities, contests, and celebration has now been reduced to one 24-hour period at the end of May. Now, I probably should add here why it's at the end of May. It should be at the end of April. And the reason for that has to do with the temperature. It's just too cold outside at the end of April. So they moved it to the end of May, early June, right after our Memorial Day break. And of course, it's much warmer then. It's much nicer to be outside. Now, our Arbor Day celebration is broken down into four basic segments. At least it was when I wrote this. It's now five. And they're not necessarily done in the order that I'm going to present them. Here we go. One, Arbor Day Banquet. 
a free meal hosted by the junior class. And I added in parentheses, free. Did someone say free? You can be sure that I'm there. Now, I should add that the junior class would spend years raising money to pay for the senior class's meal. They also used to pay for the teachers to go, but it became too costly. It was just too involved to raise all that money. So now they just cover the senior class. They also hand out the yearbooks and uh, reveal who the valedictorian is, salutatorian, and who the yearbook is dedicated to. Two, and a lot of schools do this. Two, senior prank. Students sneak into the school overnight and leave something original to remember them by. The best one I've ever witnessed was when students removed the giant C, T, and M from the first word of the school sign outside. Instead of reading Chatham High School, it now read Ha Ha High School. That's originality if you ask me. And that really is the best one I ever saw. A little side note to this is that years later, I learned that the C, when they, when they took the C, the T, and the M down, for some reason, the C got damaged. I heard it was run over by a train. The train is nearby. I'm not sure if that's true or not. So they had to buy a new C, and they fastened it onto the building much more securely than all the other letters. So a number of years later, kids went up there to try and repeat the prank, but they couldn't get the C off the building. So they just covered it with a big black uh, plastic bag. Three, and this one's new. Uh, it wasn't in the book uh, when I wrote it. There's an awards ceremony. And basically, they give out awards for the highest average and most effort in every single class. And I mean every class. It takes like two hours. Your hands really are sore from clapping by the time it's over. And the reason this came about is that because years ago, the superintendent we had thought it wasn't fair that when the Arbor Day ceremony was over, the teachers and the students all went home midday. But if you were working in the middle school and the elementary school, they had to work the remainder of the day. It just wasn't fair. So he required the high school administration to come up with something to fill up the remainder of the day. And they came up with this award ceremony. Now, also to fill the day, they have a free barbecue for all the students. The seniors, they're bus somewhere off campus while the remainder of the students stay behind and have lunch in the cafeteria. But since they can't serve all the students at one time, they rotate the students in and out of the cafeteria and those that aren't eating have other activities to do, like play board games, watching a film or whatever. But many of the kids just skip all those activities and they just sign each other's yearbooks. Next up, and this is the most important one, uh, four, is the tree planting ceremony. It's 45 minutes of the typical boring speeches, dedications, acceptances, and other blah, blah. Then all the seniors and teachers are given small shovels to scoop dirt back into the hole that the new tree has been planted in. Now, I don't know why I called them shovels when I wrote the book. They are trowels, technically. And each one, uh, they put ribbons in the colors uh, of the senior class, and that's tied around the handle of the trowel. And the last two digits of their graduation year, that's painted onto the scoop portion of the trowel. Interestingly, I have a complete 30-year set, although I, that comes with a bit of an asterisk. And that's because there was no Arbor Day celebration in 2020, of course, due to covid so it skips over that. So basically, there's a trowel for 2019 and there's one for 2021, but no 2020. But I do have a set of 30 of them for my 30 years of teaching. Now, if you're wondering what they do when it rains, basically they bring the tree inside. They put it on the stage in the auditorium and then everybody puts the uh, dirt in. And later on, after everybody leaves, the custodial staff comes in and they take the tree out. Now, one other quirky thing is that we've run out of room. We've planted so many trees over the years that there's no more space on campus to plant trees. So we actually go through the ceremony and everybody puts a little bit of dirt under the tree. And then later on, they come and they take the tree and I believe they take it to the local park and they plant it there. Now, back to what I wrote. Uh, we're up to the last one, which was four and is now five, and that is the Arbor Day Games. Pack 400 screaming kids into a small gym, and you will know what the meaning of loud really is. And then our Arbor Day celebration is over. The kids decide that they are done for the year. All learning comes to an abrupt halt, even though a month still remains of school. So I concluded the story this way. So if you're one of those people looking to restore some tradition into America's schools, why don't you propose that your district celebrate Arbor Day? My wise cracks aside, it really is a wonderful day to celebrate. Start out small and let the celebration grow over the years, just like the trees. And let's face it, there's nothing wrong with planting a few trees and having a good time. Useless? Useful? I'll leave that for you to decide. 
Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. As I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, I initially wrote this story back in the 1990s, hard to believe. And I do owe a lot of credit to Ann Flanagan. She's now retired, but back then she was a superintendent's secretary. Some people say she ran the school district. And she provided me with a lot of information on the history of Arbor Day in Chatham. And that included a map of all the trees planted up until that point and who they were dedicated to. Now, I'm way behind in getting the next original story done, but it is coming within the next couple of weeks. I think I mentioned last podcast that it involves Henry Ford, which means information overload. There's just so much written on his life. And since he was so famous, a few of you may actually know the story, but I'm hoping not. So I'll keep you in suspense as to what the exact story is about, but I do think you'll find it to be a good one. Now, as I've mentioned before, if you enjoy the podcast, please share it with someone else. I'd be greatly appreciated. Unfortunately, the forums and the groups online don't allow for self-promotion. They just basically kick you out. So that makes it difficult for me to do it personally. So anything you can do to help spread the word for the podcast, it's greatly, greatly appreciated. And I do thank you for that. Anyway, if you'd like to contact me about this episode, my books, the podcast itself, the website, whatever you want to contact me about, please do so through my email. That's steve at uselessinformation.org. You can contact me through Facebook Messenger, or you can use the contact form on the website, uselessinformation.org. Thanks as always for listening, and take care, everyone. Bye.